I want the flexibility to explore different mediums and, and shift around and, and pursue tangential creative interests and that sort of thing. Hi, uh, I'm Torin Langan. I'm right here in my home studio in the Waterloo region. I've lived here my whole life, born and raised, and I am a multimedia artist currently specializing in uh, sculpture fabrication. So I come from more of a filmmaking background. Uh, when I was, I'd say in my early teens, I discovered low budget uh, shot on video horror movies. Um, at first, when I was really young, I was terrified of anything to do with horror, and then once I discovered B-movies and realized how fun these, you know, these creature features could be, and uh, how accessible it could be to make something with just a home camcorder, started rounding up my friends and we made a lot of backyard zombie and slasher movies. I finished a feature film called Three Dead Trick or Treaters. That was a horror anthology. I did a video installation project, uh, an experimental short film called Offerings, that I built a bunch of uh, heavy sort of pagan costuming for. And from there I sort of realized I was more interested in the physical fabrication process, so building costumes, building environments, and eventually has led me now to doing sculptural work. I think it's, it's interesting because I feel like it's all storytelling. I sort of started through discovering just different worlds of art, or even just different types of experimental filmmaking. I feel like I've sort of narrowed my storytelling process down to just being how much can I tell with a single object. It wasn't until maybe like the start of lockdown when I sort of started trying to build objects that would stand on their own outside of just being purpose built for another production. I think it took me a while to sort of realize that just like other do-it-yourself forms of art that the way that I was producing sculpture was legitimate and you know using found objects or cheap materials doesn't devalue the finished product. You work with whatever you have and you make it look as good as you can and that's art. It always feels like a little bit of a magic trick to show what you can do with really limited resources. As long as the the form is striking it's gonna be a distraction from what you actually worked with. So I get a, I get a, a lot out of that and sort of making things look a lot more elaborate or expensive or high-end than they actually are. Sure. I'm going to talk about the llama because it's right back here in frame right now. Um, so that was inspired by, there was this shop that I used to go to a lot in Toronto called Holy Cow and they were primarily like a Turkish textiles shop so they sold a lot of towels and, and bathrobes and that sort of thing but the second half of the store had a lot of world antiques, a number of which were uh, sculptures used for a lot of Middle Eastern parades. And I didn't want to appropriate and build something that was directly inspired by a culture that I'm not a participant in, but it was an interesting opportunity coming from my narrative film background to think what are some pieces or some artifacts that I could build from a culture that doesn't actually exist. Um, so the llama was sort of an exercise in building something that looks like it could be, you know, like a lost antique or something that was either, you know, part of a ceremony that we don't know anything about, or maybe it was just built as, you know, something from a school play in like the 1950s that was in a church basement for years and just recently unearthed. And that sort of comes back to my interest in, you know, how much storytelling 
can you do or how much storytelling can you imply in a single object. So I do a lot of weathering. Um, I try not to, even though I'm using inexpensive materials, I really try to hide what the material is at first glance. I mean, that's mostly just sculpted out of styrofoam, but I want it to look like, oh, maybe it's wood or uh, maybe it's clay or, or metal that's been worked in some way. I'm also really excited about the piece that I'm working on right now. I feel like the llama's probably a little bit more accessible than a giant cyclops sculpture with huge horns. I'd like to think that it's always gonna be the next thing that I make that I'm the most proud of, but you know, you never know exactly how these things are gonna turn out, so fingers crossed. There's a few moments that can be a little bit bumpy through the process, um, but that's usually right before things start to get good, I've found. So I'm slowly learning in this new field of practice to continue to trust the process. The other thing that I'm trying to do with each project I take on is use that as an opportunity to teach myself a new skill. So for the, one of the last music videos I did, uh, I built a big mask that had a cable controlled blinking eye mechanism. And for the upcoming stuff that I'm going to do, I want to get more into making molds and casting and that sort of thing. I'm inspired by lots of different things, um, particularly pulp media. This is a book that I picked up recently uh, that is by an arts collective out of France called Le Dernier Cri, The Final Scream. And this was a group exhibition that they did, which was a bunch of different artists' interpretations of the Thai hell gardens. So these are, you know, uh, sculpture gardens that exist in Thailand that are all of these different depictions of what can happen to you when you go to hell. So um, this is a lot of, oh god, I don't even know if I can show some of this stuff. Um, yeah, the whole book is pretty much, um, well, it's, uh, there's a lot of different textures going on. Um, these aren't necessarily the best examples of what, what is in here, but this is um, clearly stuff that's made out of cardboard. Uh, so that's really exciting to see, you know, what that's like some real pretty janky paper mache going on there. Um, so I find this really inspiring, uh, just again, for what you can do with very little. So I'm inspired a lot by just world costuming. Uh, this is a compilation book by a photographer named Charles Frager. Some of his work went uh, viral on Facebook a while ago, and this is just a collection of a lot of Eastern European uh, folk costuming. So much of it is just based around like, you know, what materials in the community might be laying around. So it's a lot of body suits with, you know, strips of fabric that have been cut up and stitched on in these different abstract patterns. Big fan of folk art in general because like low budget filmmaking, it's a very forgiving uh, area to move into as a as a newcomer to fabrication because if it looks a little bit janky or the proportions aren't quite right or things look a little bit ramshackle that kind of adds to the character and to the storytelling of where the work is coming from. I've lived here my whole life so I've sort of seen the arts community turn over a few times and I've seen a lot of people leave. I've seen a lot of people come back as well. For years there was a really great art festival that was put together by this guy Eric Rumble. Uh, it was called Night Shift. Uh, a lot of friends of mine and myself had opportunities to either perform or exhibit work as part of this festival. Uh, it was great. It just took place over the course of one night. It was sort of... Um, Eric might not appreciate this being the way I describe it, but it was sort of KW's answer to Nuit Blanche. So a lot of uh, public installations, an opportunity for people just to sort of wander around these different corridors downtown and discover lots of different types of work that was all produced by local people. That was a really great introduction for me just to the range of work that was being produced, especially since back then I was more involved with the film community. There's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of everything going on. It's just hard to, it's hard to find it. I, I describe KW sometimes as being a region that doesn't necessarily reward you just for showing up. Uh, it's the, it really requires a lot of diligence and reaching out to people. It's not always easy to connect with like-minded artists in this town. Once you do, um, I, I find it to be pretty rewarding and I think that there's some really interesting people doing really interesting stuff here. 
I know that it maybe looks like I know what I'm doing because of the work that I've produced, but this is still very terrifying to me. The biggest part of it is just sort of maintaining my own routine and trying to figure out, you know, what I want my day to day to look like, because all of a sudden everything is just a big, <laughs> it's just a big void and everything that needs to happen in my life has to be wholly motivated by myself. Uh, which is something that I'm sure a lot of freelancers come up against. And also just the struggle of living in the same place that you work and feeling like you could always be on the clock or that you could always sort of walk over to your desk and start doing work. And I wasn't going to feel any more ready to make this leap if I waited any longer because I had a really good job for, for what it was. I was just hitting a wall where for what I am interested in pursuing right now, I wasn't going to be able to sort of dig into that um, by only pursuing it uh, on the days I had off. As far as making the leap into doing this sort of work full time, it's hard for me to be too prescriptive about what I think the right approach is, partially because I have the privilege of you know, having a supportive family, you know, my, my folks are both photographers, I have a brother who works in corporate video. I think that the space that you have access to very much dictates your creative process. I mean, I wouldn't be building things this big unless I had even this room to work out of. Uh, I'm sure a lot of folks would be great sculptors if they didn't just share a bed you know, weren't just living out of a bedroom in a shared house, maybe they're doing photography or maybe they're doing, maybe they're doing um, publishing or zine making. I'm under no illusions that my ability to do this is a product of, of privilege. Just living in southern Ontario, it's a lot more expensive to live than it used to be. I, I wish that I could just say, like, give it a shot and do it, uh, because I don't even, I can't even truly speak from an experienced place of how that'll that'll come out. I'm, I'm pretty new into this. I would say that it's just very challenging. You should do a follow-up with me in a year and and uh, and see how things are going because uh, that would be very interesting. I'd be very curious to see what a jump cut right here would look like. Anyway, that's all I got. <laughs> Does that answer your question at all?